right now we are potentially on the brink of what people are saying is World War III. There's national debt that's skyrocketing. People are losing faith in the U.S. dollar as BRICS is showing up on the scene. People can't even afford their groceries. The cost of living is crazy. Recession indicators are flashing everywhere. And we've got elections coming up in November. So uh, things are pretty nuts right now. And so I'm very excited right now to introduce you to today's guest, Kevin Demerit. He's a very sought after, respected analyst, the author of The Bulls, the Bears, the Bust. And he has successfully predicted market crashes and helped investors navigate through tumultuous times. He has over 20 years of experience and he's the founder of Lear Capital. And be sure to stick around to the end because he's got a special offer that could put an extra $250 in your pocket today. Don't miss it. And I'm very excited about it because I've got a lot of questions for you to figure out like what I want to do. And we're going to get to that more here in just a little bit uh, to help out the audience. But also, I just want to get your perspective on everything that's going on. What do you anticipate is coming? And what do you think like we should expect. Yeah, first of all, you know, thanks for having me on the program, Steve. Really uh, love the program. Uh, you know, great job and, you know, proud to be on it. Uh, you know, those are great questions. And really, I think my what makes me most nervous is that we are literally drowning in a record $35 trillion worth of, you know, government debt. And interest payments alone uh, this year and, and next year are going to be near a trillion dollars which means wow. we're printing up about $2.7 billion a day just to pay the interest on the debt. So we're borrowing just to pay interest. Uh, at some point that's gonna catch up to you. Um, it always has in, in all the other countries. And it, 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 the trickle down effect of the inflation, the devaluation of the dollar, potentially losing the world's reserve currency status could be devastating. Uh, to people with their investments and their retirement savings. How much time do you think we have before we really start to see some serious impacts? I know that it seems like every day people are saying it's just getting harder and harder to make it day to day. But like, as far as what you're seeing, how much time do we have with this? Well, you know, everybody's seem to have been talking about recession or no recession for the past, you know, year. Uh, and that makes no sense to me. I mean, people have to really wake up here because if you look at a couple of indicators that uh, have predicted recessions, like an inverted yield curve, it has been 100% accurate since you know the 1950s. The, the issue with it is that it could happen in six months when it goes inverted all the way to you know, two years. Um, let me back up a second. You know, a lot of people say, well, what the heck is an inverted yield curve, right? That, so let's just start there. An inverted yield curve would mean that the long dated bond, so a 30 year bond has an interest rate that's lower than an interest rate six months or a year out. So it's inverted. Normally what you would do is say, well, I need to get paid more for my money. If I'm gonna tie it up for 30 years, I want you know 5% of my money and I'm gonna get 2% if I, if I invest it short term. That's normally the way the curve happens. Now it's inverted. What typically that means is that the anticipation of the experts in the market are that they're going to have to lower interest rates because a recession is coming. So that's why an inverted yield curve uh, is usually a pretty good indicator of a recession or something bad hap going to potentially happen in the economy. Again, the, uh, the challenge with it is that it can happen in six months to two years. So right now we're at about the 12 month mark. So you're kind of in the middle of, of, of where the prediction would potentially come. So if you're sitting around thinking, okay, well, do I really wanna pull my money out of some of these other investments if I think it's gonna run for another year? Maybe the answer is no. The other indicator that I like much more and has only happened four times in 150 years is when M2 or what we call the money supply, so your checking accounts, savings accounts, all of your liquid cash is really considered M2. If that decreases by 2% in any quarter, which has only happened four times in 150 years, then a recession is on the horizon, usually within a six month time period. That just happened last quarter. Uh -huh. So if I had to guess that by the end of this year, first quarter of next year, we're going to have a recession, how bad? I have no idea. But when you've printed up this much money and you have the dollar being liquidated by central banks around the world, the uh, employment is slowing down. I think you're going to, you know, get a recession here in that. And by the end of first quarter of next year, I would say the recession comes. And I think the market correction that comes along with it's probably fairly substantial. Okay, so two 
recession indicators going off. We have the inverted yield curve, and in addition to that, the M2 money supply decreasing by 2%. Both of these happening within just the last year. Yeah, when you have both of them uh, going off at the same time, then, you know, like I say, it, it, the, the, the money supply, look, money makes the world go round, right? Yeah. Uh, love makes the world go round, money makes it go faster. So uh, the, the gasoline that drives the economy is money. And when that supply starts to shrink back down and then, you know, the, the government's been not uh, spending or printing as much money as they have been in the last couple of years because of COVID and so on and so forth, but they're still printing a lot of money, but it's all slowing down. And that gasoline that drives the economies. Uh, getting pulled back. So hard to kind of kick start it again, unless you get the recession, you kind of flush out the economy, the stocks come down to reasonable levels, real estate comes down to reasonable levels. You know, you can only drive things up so high and then the bubble bursts and they come back down to reality. And I think that's where we are right now. So with these indicators going off, simultaneously, we've got all of these concerns about war and elections. What historically happens with our economic, you know, our financial situation here in the United States when we have that as well. Well, I would break both of them apart. Elections, um, usually running up to an election, the economy will do OK because the Fed wants to be um, supportive of the of the president. So, you know, you are probably going to get an interest rate decrease in September and that kind of pushes the economy uh, through to the end of the year. That's why I think next year, the beginning of the quarter, once you know, whoever we have elected is elected, then you're, you're probably going to see some problems there. The election just makes things uncertain. Who's, whose policies are really going to affect the economy? What scares me about uh, Kamala Harris is if she's talking about price controls, that has yeah. never worked in the history of the world, <laughs> yeah. ever. It's, it didn't work in Russia. It has not worked in any other country. It did not work here in the United States in the 70s. Matter of fact, it made inflation much, much, much worse. So she just needs to back off of that. Or I think you're going to get a lot of economists and, and, and market prognosticators come out and say, hey, look, that is not going to work. That's going to make things a heck of a lot worse. And she's talking about food, by the way. And if you look at the industry that has some of the smallest margins out there, it's grocery stores. So if you're going to control prices on grocery stores, they're just not going to make any money and they're going to start going broke. Um, then they lift those price uh, controls and the price is absolutely skyrocketed, which is exactly what happened in the 70s. And we end up with 15 percent inflation. So, wow. you know, if she's talking about things like that, then that could be a concern. But mostly I, I think, you know, presidential elections are kind of run up to the election. Then you figure out what's really going to happen to the economy. War, on the other hand, is a completely different story. Those are extremely expensive, they're extremely volatile, and you just never know what the outcome of war is going to be. Who's going to get involved? How much money is it going to cost? You know, a lot of bad things happen in war that are unexpected and uncertain, and the markets do not like uncertainty uh, in war or situations like that. It's pretty much said that there's going to be like a, a rate cut coming here in September. But then after that, as we get into 2025, that's when we could potentially see things begin to unravel. Um, so with that being said, just just that right there, I've got a question for you. So like with your expertise, what should somebody listening to this right now start taking into consideration for themselves and their family if they wanted to prepare, knowing that this is just right around the corner? Well, you've got a couple of things happening. One is you have a volatility. So you need alternative type investments that are going to rise when volatility increases. And you have inflation rates that are historically higher than the Fed likes them. They're not back down to the two and a half percent. And I believe they're going to stay a little bit higher for longer. So you're going to have possibly a similar situation that we saw uh, in the dot-com crash in the 2000s, early 2000s, and then the 2008. So somewhere in between those is kind of the recession that I, or the market corrections that I potentially see coming wow. with the addition of inflation being higher than where the Fed wants. So they're going to only have so much they can do to lower interest rates down uh, before you get inflation starting to you know pop back up. How important is that inflation? Well, since January of 2020, the dollar has lost 24% of its purchasing power because of inflation. That's why it's tough to go out and buy groceries and, and, and other you know, necessities uh, that we all purchase. It, it's just the value of the dollar has fallen by 24%. 
if you leave inflation at 4% for four years, you've lost another 16% of your purchasing power. So they can't leave it too much higher than 3% for too long, or we're just all going to feel it. Um, and the recession's going to last a heck of a lot longer. So uh, if you think inflation's going to be higher for longer, and you believe that there's going to be a correction in the market with volatility, what assets are going to, going to help? Uh, real estate, typically, because it's an inflationary hedge. The precious metals market is going to be a great place to be because it's a great inflation, inflation hedge. It you know, hits uh, $850 an ounce from $50 an ounce starting in the early 70s all the way up to the end. In 1980, it hit $850 an ounce. Through that time period, inflation went from 3% to 15%. So great inflation hedge and great uh, with market volatility because if you look back in 2008 when we saw that volatility, price of gold went from around $650 an ounce all the way up to $2,000 an ounce. Uh, the silver price went from six or seven dollars an ounce all the way up to forty nine dollars an ounce. So precious metals are going to be liquid, uh, a great hedge against inflation and a great hedge against the volatility. It's called an inverse. They have an inverse relationship with most traditional type investments like uh, paper investments like stocks and bonds and things like that. Wow. OK, I want to ask you more about that here in just a bit. But first, I wanted to tap into something that you mentioned that I thought was very interesting. And you were saying how much the U.S. dollar is losing value. We've got inflation going on. Um, and a big thing I'm hearing a lot about is BRICS. Uh, and I wanted to get your thought on that. And if you could kind of break it down for somebody that maybe is just hearing about this for the first time and how this is going to be impacting us directly in our financial system. Yeah, so uh, for anyone that that is just hearing about BRICS, it's five countries and they call it BRICS because it's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So these countries got together uh, and they're trying to form a currency that would compete with the US dollar for the world's reserve currency. Um, and I have a quote here to give some sort of idea of what their thought is. Uh, they said, and this is at one of their conventions, and I quote, the goal of BRICS is to reduce the economic and political dependence on the US dollar. We want to create a new international currency replacing the US dollar as a means of a transactional unit. Okay. Well, Steve, I look for tipping points and things. And a lot of different countries, China by itself tried to uh, become, you know, their REM NIMBY. Uh, they wanted that be to become the world's reserve currency. And finally, these five countries get together and say, okay, we've got a better shot of this. And maybe we'll back a little bit of this currency with gold, which would give it a lot of stability because the US dollar up until 1974 was backed by gold. Meaning that every time you printed a dollar, you needed to add some gold to the reserve. So that controlled the money printing. If BRICS did this, you'd have a very, very strong currency uh, because you'd have to, you know, it'd be backed by gold. On top of that, as far as a tipping point, those countries represent 3.2 billion people, which is approximately 40% of the world's population. Wow. You don't need to get very much further to get to a point where you have 50% of the world's population saying, look, I do not want the, the dollar to be the world's reserve currency. I want, I want this other currency, BRICS, or whatever they're going to call it, uh, to be the world's reserve currency. On top of that, that's, these countries represent about 42% of the global consumption of oil, uh, about 27% of economic output. So you're getting close to having someone that's, that, that wants to compete with the US dollar and has the ability to potentially do that. At their last convention, you've had 30 other countries, including Taiwan. You know, Taiwan is a, is a ally of ours and they want to join the BRICS. Uh, organization for this for this currency, plus 30 other countries. If that happens, then I think you get a, a, a swing over and you've got some competition for the US dollar. On top of that, you have most of the world central banks that have been liquidating US currency and replacing it with gold. That's why the gold price is at record highs right now. Those central banks around the world have liquidated billions of dollars worth of US currency and treasuries and then moved over to um, you know, the gold market in anticipation that they'll take the gold and move it over to something else, which makes sense because I would rather hold gold than a currency that's falling 24%. So saying all of that and trying to set that up, hopefully that was fairly clear about what BRICS is and what's happening. What happens to your dollar if 
BRICS takes over and the U.S. currency um, becomes not the world's cur reserve currency. Okay, so if you have the world's reserve currency, all central banks hold part of that currency because that's the currency that they use to buy oil and other commodities and goods and services around the world, right? So you have a lot of these central banks holding this currency outside the United States. Matter of fact, more than 50% of currency is held outside the United States by different central banks and people around the world. Now they say, okay, I wanna liquidate those, that currency and I wanna move to a different currency. The problem in that case is what happens to the currency that they liquidated? It comes back to the United States. What's the definition of inflation? Too much money chasing too few goods. Wow. You get this swarm of money coming back into the United States the dollar gets more devalued, you have more currency coming in, and inflation goes potentially through the roof. That's what's happened with other world's reserve currencies when they've ended. So Portugal, France, Great Britain, when they went from the world's reserve currency and somebody else took over, usually they had a bout of inflation for seven, eight, nine years because all of that currency just came flooding back into their economy and devalued the currency that was out there. Wow, so this is like, a strategic plan by these nations to kind of kick the U.S. dollar out of its position of power in the financial world. Well, yes, uh, they there was a couple. There's a couple of reasons. They the the two reasons that the countries were talking about moving away. One of it was sanctions, so they called it economic warfare from the United States, where they have just used the dollar as a weapon to sanction other other countries and there's 30 countries that have sanctions on them because of the us dollar or mm -hmm. using the us dollar okay so they say look if i'm holding your dollar and then you use it against me for something you don't like i don't like that i'd rather have a currency in my central bank that is not going to be used against me it's not going to be held up or i can't use uh, like what happened in Russia and so on and so forth. There may be good reasons in Russia, but I don't really know about the other 30 countries. So they don't like the weaponization of the dollar and they don't like how much money is being printed because if I'm holding this dollar and it fell 24% and I own billions and billions or even trillions of dollars worth of the dollar, I'm just losing money holding it. So they're printing too much money and they've weaponized the dollar. Not a good scenario and countries are looking for a way out. The BRICS right now, this is a real threat to the U.S. dollar. This really, they they position everything to the point where they really could essentially kick the dollar out. Yeah. Do you anticipate, like, how much time do we have before something like this could unfold? Uh, usually it very, happens very slowly and then very quickly. Um, if you look back at other world reserve currencies, then you see that uh, – Usually those currencies last around on average about 100 years. We're at about 103 years for the dollar. I would say that this BRIC situation is probably gonna play itself out over the next seven to 10 years. I mean, that, that, that's what I think. But while that's happening, the first three or four years, you're gonna get more central bank selling of the R currency, maybe more purchasing of gold or, or BRICS currency. And then once that tipping point happens and you have more than 50% of the population or more than 50% of the economic uh, consumption with the countries that are involved, then they're just going to sell dollar in droves. And, and, and that's where you have usually the bigger issue. So I would say you've got three or four years to try to figure out, is this going to happen? Isn't it going to happen? If you continue to see selling by the central banks, then I would say that you're on the path of us at some point losing uh, the world's reserve uh, currency status. And Janet Yellen even came out a couple of months ago and said, look, I have a concern with the world's reserve you know, status for the U.S. dollar. Now, so when if, when that happens, the United States essentially are we going to be on the verge of like an economic collapse? It's not so much an economic collapse. It's just that the you're a couple of things people are going to have to get used to. One is going to be higher inflation for a while because all those dollars are getting repatriated back into the United States. So that's one thing everybody needs to be prepared for. And the second thing you need to be prepared for is that everything in the world is denominated in U.S. currency: oil prices, commodity prices, everything. And if other countries, if you if you if anyone is listening and lived in Europe, if you have a the, the euro and you wanted to purchase oil and the price of oil has dropped 10 percent, but your currency dropped 20 percent, you've got two things going on and you're paying 10 percent more for oil that actually went down by 10 percent. Here in the United States, if the oil price drops 10 percent, we pay less because it's denominated in our currency. 
If that wasn't the case, then I need to pay attention to what my currency is doing against other currencies, plus what the commodity prices are doing. And it makes it much harder on the economy and people because uh, prices of commodities and your currency and the price of the currency, who's now the world reserve currency, all fluctuate at different levels and can cause problems with cost of goods sold if companies are trying to buy you know, commodities to produce goods and services, so on and so forth. Or even if you're just going to the pump and filling your car with gas, those gas prices could fluctuate a lot more um, and are much more expensive in Europe than they are here for that reason. Maybe the next three, four years or so, we need to really keep an eye on this to make sure we figure out what direction this is going to be heading. I'd be curious to see what the United States does to respond to all this. I've, I've been seeing a lot lately of like economic collapse and a lot of like, you know, I, I don't know like the reality of it, but one of the things that I see tied directly to that is like they say the skyrocketing U.S. debt. Um, what, what's your take on that? Because would that bring financial collapse? I hear people saying we can't sustain. We're going to be punishing, you know, our future generations for the debt that we're doing. What does that actually look like? Uh, I'd love to hear your take on that. Yeah. So the, the U.S. debt to me is is the most concerning because you could fix it. You can stop it but the politicians don't want to do it. Mm. Right? They, they, they understand that at some point, there's definitely a tipping point where you just can't afford it. I mean, it would be like you and I just charging up our credit cards. And at some point, you know, look, we're not the US government. We can't print money in our, in our garage and just willy nilly uh, go out and spend it. But at some point they have too much interest that they need to pay to continue to increase, continue to increase the money supply, right? So you've got a couple of things going on. Um, you either slow down the money supply, which is happening right now, but it's going to put you in a recession and it could put you in a bad recession. And people are going to have to go through that. The politicians say, well, I'm not going to get elected if that happens. So I'm going to keep I'm going to keep pumping money out. OK, the other thing that's important for people to understand is it's virtually impossible for the government to stop printing money. So when you start printing the money. At some point. Uh, in that printing. Uh, process, people think, well, oh, you know, let's just pay it back and, and stop the money printing. It's virtually impossible. So I have an example, Steve, that I always give people that it, it takes a second and we'll just, I'll run through this. And you, you and I live on an island. You are the banker and somehow as the banker, incredibly enough, you have all the money that's on the island, which is 10 shells. So we're going to use shells as money. And I come to you and I said, Steve, I have the most fantastic idea. Uh, for this business opportunity, but I need 10 shells to make it work. And you said, you know, that's the best idea I've ever heard. I'm going to loan you those 10, 10 shells and I'm going to charge you 10% interest. So you owe me 11 shells at the end of the year. Fantastic. I grab the 10 shells. I go out into the economy. I grab all my goods and I sell ice cream and I sell everybody on the island ice cream. I get all 10 shells back and I come to you as the banker at the end of the year and I say, Steve, this business did fantastic. Here's your 10 shells. And you said, great, but I own your business now. Why? Because I don't have an 11th shell. You as the banker needed to print that shell out of thin air for me to pay the interest back to you. So if you didn't do that, then I can't pay you. So I'm going to go broke or you're going to take over my ice cream business. Okay. Now think about the government. They've printed up the money, they've lent out the money. You and I have taken that money, purchased a house, purchased a car, whatever we've done. And if the government just stopped the printing of the money, we would go broke. That's why this M2 money supply decreasing by 2% is such a big deal and why it's a great predictor of a recession because they've tried to slow down the money supply, but that means at some point, some of us can't pay interest. And with credit card debt at all time high and car loans at all time high, but delinquency starting to go through the roof, where's the money going to come from to pay that back? Well, you can't stop the money printing. So when you've gone over a point, over a certain point, and interest is almost a trillion dollars a year, it's just going to get worse. And that's the point of no return. Uh, and we're not quite there yet, but we're getting fairly close. So for somebody listening to this, hearing all of these things that are going on, what are some of the things that we should be looking at? I heard you mention real estate, gold, silver, some of these things. And how should somebody position themselves to make sure that they are safe? Them and their families are making the right decisions as we're on the brink of a lot of this stuff unfolding. Yeah, so 
that example that I just brought up where I said the money supply is chasing the same amount of goods. Those are types. Those are the types of investments that you would like to get into. So I can't produce any more real estate. So if you have an increase in the money supply or too much money out there with the inflation rate higher, and you have a fixed supply of real estate, if you have a increased demand on a fixed supply, prices go up. That's going to hold true for real estate. That's going to hold true for uh, gold. It's going to hold true for silver because they're only pulling out so much out of the ground each year. It's it's a tiny percent. They only pull out. You know, the, the, they're basically pulling out about the same amount of gold that they pulled out 50 years ago. So even with all of this new mining technology and so on and so forth, they have to go deeper into the ground. So you have this fixed supply with an increase in money supply, and then you get the fall in the stock market. That money is going to look for a place to go, typically the alternative type of investments, and drive up those prices. So like I said, that's why the precious metals are starting to make some moves, why gold's at record highs, even though it looks like it should go much, much higher than where we are today. And the silver price is basically on sale. So if I had to start and I was an investor, I would look at silver right now. I think it's an incredible opportunity with lower downside risk with an incredible upside potential. All right. So so you said silver. Um, so like I know that this is not financial advice for anybody listening to this, but uh, I'd be curious, like, so if somebody wants to diversify and they want to get into silver, um, are there certain recommendations you would have about how they should go in about that, how much they would take into consideration for their portfolios or things like that? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. That's a great question. And, you know, Steve, everybody's a little bit different. So somebody starting off in life, uh, you know, maybe they're a little bit more aggressive. Somebody later on in life may need uh, uh, income. So they might need a smaller portion in assets that do not produce that type of income, but they still want some stability and, and liquidity. So everybody's different. The best thing that I can say to everybody is just get educated. You know, get the information, take a look at it, try to get as educated, ask us as many questions as, as you'd like, talk to your financial planner about it, and, and then make an educated decision on, is this right for you? I, I would believe it would be for everyone, depending on what portion of your portfolio, but that's something that the people should decide based on the education that they get on how they feel about where the economy is going and some of the things that we're talking about. Now, if somebody wanted to get educated on that, like, do you have resources available? Yeah, we have you know, a lot of the things you've we've been talking about. We have a special report on. So we have a report on uh, the, the, the name of the report is debt, de dollarization and the digital dollar. So we talk about a lot of the things we're talking about with the debt and how that could influence uh, your investing, um, how de dollarization, talking about bricks and how the U.S. dollar might lose its reserve. Uh, status. And then the digital dollar, you know, the government's been talking about a digital dollar, people been talking about Bitcoin, how, how do those affect, um, you know, some of the investments out there. So we put a special report together, we're going to give it away free on your program. And any just anyone that goes to Lear, L-E-A-R, Ram.com, L-E-A-R, Ram.com, just ask for the free report. And then they can call us at 800-411-2430. That's 800-411-2430. And I, you know, I just absolutely love your program. So I wanted to do something special today. So what we're going to do, and I've only done this a couple of different times, is anyone that calls on the program and they would like to purchase precious metals, we're going to put $250 credit into their account right when they call. They can use that $250 if they want to uh, have it shipped to them uh, for home delivery or to a depository. They can use it for the shipping insurance uh, and everything to get it to wherever they would like it to go. Or if they have an IRA and they were thinking about taking a portion of their IRA and moving it over to precious metals, that $250 will cover uh, the custodial fees and the shipping to get the metals over there. So we're just going to put that into the portfolio free of charge. Wow. Thank you for offering that. That is super cool. So anybody listening to this, Take advantage of this right now, the $250 towards your portfolio. Thank you so much for offering that, Kevin. Appreciate that a ton. Um, so you guys, that's going to be linked down in the description below. And I just wanted to say, like, there's so much going on in the world. I appreciate you taking time out to let us know your thoughts on this. Um, and again, thanks so much. Uh, this has been really, uh, really informative and awesome. Great. Thanks, Steve. Thanks.